So we'll start with a short introduction while I'll frame the question for our session today. Then we'll go on to three technical presentations from different research teams uh, of three different projects. The Interreg Eco project um, with Andrew and Martin that will give us a presentation of the uh, Eco one-stop shop. Then we'll go on to the Compa project and we'll talk about the maturity scale presented by Michael. Um, and then finally, we'll have a final presentation on the monitoring tool from the Scale 203050 project uh, that will be presented by Thomas Hopper of uh, the Technical University of Delft. And then we'll spend the rest of the session with three practitioners, three um, leaders of the community energy movement, um, and specifically three leaders from federations of the movement that are looking at community development, not as a, only as a, let's say, uh, an experience of a community group, but also in terms of a support network and how do you understand the development of community initiatives from a support point of view. And then we'll finish at 10.30 with a couple of conclusions. With this, why is it so difficult to assess community development? Well, the main issue really is that energy communities are very multifaceted organizations. They, they are very different forms depending on the countries. They are very different in terms of their activities, in terms of their, uh, their placement in the energy market. Uh, so we cannot use the traditional, uh, the traditional market uh, indicators, but also um, they are much more uh, you know, governance driven than activity driven. I mean, in general, the concept of energy communities, as most of you, uh, is linked to a uh, citizen led governance system. And so therefore, it is much more important in the way we organize collectively rather than the way we actually deliver the activity. And so there already you can see that the types of indicators that we can use to understand community development is, let's say, a bit more complex than for traditional businesses. And that's really where the challenge comes in. On one hand, the diversity of initiatives. On the second hand, the aspect of the variety of activities and the variety of roles that uh, energy communities are playing in the market today. And so therefore really the common areas or the commonalities of energy communities is really this governance driven approach. The aspect of understanding or uh, formalizing the uh, participation of private citizens into the, um, the energy market. The third problem is this large informal phase. Can you please mute your mic when you come into the session? Thank you. The third problem is the large informal development phase. And so what I mean by large informal development phase is a, the, the, the largest part in the life of an energy community or a community energy initiatives. And I think it's important to understand that today we're gonna to talk about this too. We're gonna to talk about energy communities that are citizen driven, uh, have a very large phase where we do not have a structure to really uh, point to. We do not have yet a, a clear uh, traceable um, form that we can point to. And so therefore this large informal phase is at the same time extremely important because it will determine the success or the failure of the initiative. But at the same time, it's very difficult for support networks to really uh, understand or, or really uh, approach those, those uh, informal phases, those weak signals in the market somehow. And then the final point is energy communities are based on collaboration versus competition. And so therefore it's very difficult to really see the diversity of initiatives because they tend to aggregate and they tend to be you know, the, the forest that is hidden by the tree. Uh, that is the case in many countries where some organizations are very visible, but somehow we do not see all the different collectives that are behind. And so there the understanding of the process of creation of energy communities is very difficult because it feels like the community, a community is growing, but really it's not a community, it's a multitude of communities, which is not the case when you're looking at certain competitive indicators, uh, typical market assessment values that are usually easier to, to approach in terms of understanding environmental criteria. And so there really, uh, we're gonna see, we're gonna try to tackle those three questions. On one hand, how do you assess governance? Right? which is really the main point for energy communities. The second part is really how do you uh, access those informal faces, those weak signals, how do you capture them? And then finally, how do you understand the growth in networks versus you know, the typical market growth uh, assessment that exists today? But why is this important to 
to to let's say to understand that what what, what is the goal really of, of assessing energy communities well the reason behind that is is from from the various projects that you can hear today and as well as you know experiences from the networks of, of uh, rescue EU is that there are more and more initiatives that you know we struggle to understand uh, let's say we struggle to really decipher the true from the false and, and the first issue of course that we're going to talk about is for corporate capture uh, today in the markets uh, as the energy community concepts are being transposed into member state law um, the efforts by certain companies to take advantage of the concept to pervert somehow the goals of the energy community is becoming more and more important i mean one of uh, one of the versions of this debate is in in belgium with the resco versus spinco debate uh, so the, the uh, renewable source cooperative versus the financial cooperatives in greece uh, it is happening as well where the repository of the government is made up of 800 cooperative yet the cooperative federation in greece is currently uh, estimating that there is about 20 initiatives that are really uh, uh, you know abiding or by the abiding by the, the final goals of energy communities and, and that are citizen led so this is a, a, a problem that is becoming more and more important and for to solve that problem it's very important to provide the right tools and indicators to regulators the second part is that there is a gap in community development so once we uh, are from a support standpoint to energy communities, it becomes very difficult to have a systematic approach to understanding the steps of growth of uh, energy communities. And really here, the problem that we have is that from the point of view of the public powers, but also from the point of view of the various networks that are currently supporting energy communities, they are very different approaches based usually on activities rather than a unified approach based on certain milestones that do exist that are common in the experience of uh, the creation of energy communities. And then the final point of uh, what is the issue is really to create that common language, to make sure that we can actually have a base for conversation that is the same all across the continent. And really here that is becoming very important because once we see and, and we'll discuss it later on with our practitioners once we have federation that starts to develop more and more community initiative it becomes very important to also be able to share experience to understand each other and the place where we are at a certain point once again the goal is not to rank it's not to grade it's not to say something is good or something is bad but rather to say okay we are at this point now how can we go further how can we grow how can we create a path that is really, uh, you know, that we, that we benefit from the experience of the rest of uh, the community energy movements. Right, on this note, I'll uh, shut up now and pass on to the actual researchers that have looked at this, those problems and, and tried to find a couple of solutions. So we'll start with a presentation from the Internet Echo Project and specifically uh, MTU, so the University of Munster in Ireland, where uh, Martin and Andrew, uh, Andrew De Guan and Martin Hill uh, will present the tool of the one-stop shop. So Martin is the head of department of electronic and electronic engineering of the Munster Technological University. He's also a senior researcher for the ECHO project. Um, while Andrew is a senior researcher for the same institute and has worked on many projects in the IoT spaces. Together, they have brought forward the ECHO one-stop shop that is a uh, tool that was built to support the development of ECHOs, uh, which are energy communities, uh, part of the Internet ECHO project. And with this, uh, Martin, Andrew, it's up to you. I'll just check if you can see it, the slide. Yes. Okay. I'll skip straight ahead. So I'll just briefly tell you what ECHO is. So ECHO is an interreg funded project. Um, it should have run from 2017 to 2020. We then got a capitalization, which moved it on. And then COVID has actually meant we will finish in 22. Uh, there are 11 partners representing uh, 
regional authorities, support groups, and uh, local energy uh, cooperatives uh, across six countries. So actually, this is this is the challenge we're 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 we're, we're trying to deal with, which is that at the transnational level, both EU and the uh, climate uh, agreements, there are targets. Uh, so for for Ireland, for example, our target is uh, zero emission zero uh, by 2050, and that is transferred down to the region we're in, which is down here in the south of Ireland and Cork, to a regional authority. They set a target for a 7% reduction per year over the next 10 years in their decarbonization zones. And ultimately, it comes down to the citizen. And, and, and here in Ireland, we have something called sustainable energy communities, which are groups that if there are many of them across the country. But the challenge here, I think, for us is to, to link all of this together and to enable those groups to achieve what they set out to achieve. So that's what we're trying to do is to link these layers together. And, and going back to what Stan said, the question is, how do, we, how do we measure progress of the citizen groups and support them? And then how does policy get driven by that? Uh, this, this is where we started with- uh, Sorry, Martin, to interrupt. Yeah. Do you maybe have a, a headset? Because uh, I've seen that some of the, of the participants uh, can't hear you very well. <laughs> oh, I don't sometimes it works. Is that any better? Can you say something? Yeah, is that any better? Uh, I think it's the same. Um, but yeah. Okay, let's Please. let's maybe move on. Yeah. Uh, Martin, can you get closer to your computer? That way we can hear you better. Thank you. Yeah, okay. The headset is a problem for me. I'm not sure why. So we, we, we're working on the theory that, that community energy is still back at this stage of innovation and early adoption. And it faces the challenge that every technology or innovation faces, which is this chasm. And we're trying to support people to get into this majority widespread adoption phase. And that takes three things. It takes, according to the theory of diffusion and innovation, communication channels, inevitably some time, and the social system. And we're focused on communication channels and the social system because this is the policy that supports the, 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 the policy environment that supports the development of community energy. Uh, in eco, we set out with nine existing beacon ecos. So these are energy communities which would be serve as examples for, for new startups. And then we shared their experience. And the idea was to set up at least 50 new, I think we have over 100 new ECOs, which are energy community cooperatives set up in the project. And the idea is to link these together. So that's what we're trying to do, use the beacon sites to inspire, link communities and policymakers, because that's the essential element of the fusion of innovation to make sure the social environment uh, environment, policy environment is correct. But ultimately it's project and community focused. And that's what we that's what we set out to achieve. Um, so we have the communities at the lower level. Um, within the communities, we support the setting up of community groups in a digital platform and communication. We then focus on those communities developing projects. And this is, we try to measure the progress of each individual project uh, for the communities. Uh, Andrew will discuss that. We then try to network the communities together because, again, the fusion of innovation says that, that if, if my near neighbor has a positive experience and shares it with me, that's the greatest incentive for me to take an initiative. At the next layer, we have the support regional authorities, universities, and we need to connect the communities to them in a two way system because obviously the regional authorities need feedback on how. How communities are progressing, whether their policies are supporting progress. And then finally, you have the, the, the national or EU level, where again, you want to gather data. And this is where the measurement is important because that data has to accurately reflect not only progress, but how long the progress is taking. So this is what the tool looks like. So this is our, our, our one stop shop logo. It centers on two layers. Um, so we, you sign up as a user, you become part of a community group, your own community group. 
and that community group works on projects. The projects are then um, shared within the group and also publicly on this uh, public showcase um, window. And in the tool we have, uh, in the one-stop shop, we have a progress tool. And that's a survey that attempts to take each project and map it onto a timeline, which was developed by our French partner, EPV. Uh, and it, it progresses from awareness through development through completion. Uh, and it, the progress tool that Andrew will describe tries to give you a location along three different strands, uh, people, technology, and finance. And then linking to where you are, it gives you access to resources or tools that are helpful at that phase of development. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to measure progress, use it to guide you to the right resources, and also take that data and share it with the policymakers so that they can see how, how uh, projects are progressing. So Andrew will now show you the actual tools, so I'll stop sharing. Hi everyone, I hope you can see my screen. Um, just Martin uh, described there, this is an online platform, a digital platform that the One Stop Shop is, and anybody can register. Uh, it's a uh, community social platform where once you're a user, you can create a project, <clears throat> an energy project, and you'll be then met with a survey to describe. Andrew, sorry, could you? Yes. Could you zoom into your screen so we can see it a little bit bigger? Right now it's a tiny bit small. Uh, I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'm gonna, the browser. Yeah, this is a website, a web platform where- Thank you. Yes, sorry, Stan. Um, you can create your own um, project where you can detail the, the technologies that are there, project start dates, descriptions, all the kind of metrics that we thought were important um, to, to be visible to everybody. Um, like Martin said, it's a social platform in that you're showcasing your projects and uh, everybody can see where you're at uh, different development stages. And as he says, there are three strands that we thought were important to, to measure. Um, in this survey, um, there are people, uh, that these are kind of social group activities that you, we need to capture. And the, obviously the technical activity because you're using technologies, um, how are you progressing in uh, not just acquiring them and developing them and putting them together. And obviously the financial uh, element as well, where you obviously need funding. I, I don't think communities will have um, rich funds and so this is where the support layers come in and to, to pump some funds into um, these projects. But uh, the, the important thing to, to note with this is that this is a localized uh, survey. This is specific uh, to, to Ireland um, and thus the, 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 the questions are more uh, closer to, to the mechanisms that are in place in, in our context. Um, but as Stan highlighted, the, the challenges is to how do you translate this so that it's universally understood and that everybody in not just EU, hopefully, but globally understands the, the challenges to, to achieve this. And so this is just a platform to, to kickstart your project. Um, you fill this in as accurately as you can and hopefully as, as uh, frequently as you can so that your progress will always be um, visible. And so this is will be the page that will be created. Um, this is just a sample project. Once you fill out your survey, you'll have you'll have this kind of dashboard, you know, um, and this will be the metrics that we're trying to to um, to watch to monitor. And so the three strands are there: people, technology, and finance. And this is the, the graphic or the roadmap, the visual uh, representation of where you're at from start to finish. And this is just a very crude model, but uh, as, as Martin mentioned, at each stage of your development, you will hopefully in this platform be presented with all the resources needed to progress to the next stage. And so if you have, if you need expertise in, in facilitating group or raising awareness, for example, or, or different types of technologies or to how, where to acquire them or funding mechanisms, this will be a platform where you could accel um, accelerate that by you know, have access to all the tools. And so in this, in this platform, there's a resources page. I won't go into that in much detail. So all users, if you're an expert, you can submit your masterclass, for example, so you can create curriculums, uh, courses to, to facilitate that. And so it's a, it's a social uh, community-wide uh, free access, hopefully. Um, but the important uh, element of this as well is as you're submitting all the different inputs, um, the important uh, signals that need to be um, seen is by the support layer is all the, the statistics, the, the metrics that are here. So for instance, if I'm at this stage of this project, which is, you know, according to this overall index, 18.7%, 
and I'm, I'm let's say I've progressed uh, in my, you know, I've, I've ticked one box. Yes, I've, I've hosted public meetings and you tick that one. And, you know, all the other things that are, are your, hopefully you're progressing um, the project. The support layers, for example, um, we have one here, we, it's called SEAI, the, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. They'll have visibility then on where you are currently and then they might come in and, and help you uh, perhaps, you know, probably the, the financial side, what to support, what uh, funding, what grants can you have access to to move you along. And so all these metrics are captured <clears throat> and so and then it'll be visible to the support la layers and they'll, they'll be able to then um, help you along and uh, not not just that you can directly reach out to them and spe uh, specify w which part you're, you're stuck on and then this will be a, a continuous iterative uh, progress and by having this in the one platform uh, the vision really is to have a digital platform so that you can uh, everybody can see full transparency where you're at and then you know ask questions it's the phenomena of social media how are you you know it's a catalyst for for the whole thing but the 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 main challenge as Stan mentioned is this is a very i'll just give a, a show i'll show you this is the slide i shared to stan um Andrew, i don't know if that makes sense start the wrap up yes yes Thank you. um the questions are here are so um specific and localized to our to our context but how do we translate that to have a, a more uh, understandable universal index of the progress? I hope I'm, I'm making sense um, with this, but this is just one of the aspects of the one-stop shop. But the main one is to showcase your project. Where are you? Um, three strands, people, technology, and finance. And then you're from awareness to full development, full uh, operational stage. And you, know, you have all the, the picture in between. And so I hope I made sense. And that was a rush to presentation. Thank you, Stan. Thank you for everybody for listening. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thanks, Martin, as well. Um, that was the presentation from the Echo One Stop Shop, uh, which was really the basis for the start of that work on, on looking at the process of development of the Community Energy Initiative. And really, those three strands, you will find them throughout the presentation. Uh, Andrew already kind of spoiled the surprise, but then we're going to go to the next tool, which is the maturity scale from the Compa project. Uh, and there, uh, Michel brenner Fleiser from Yonem Research uh is going to present that tool so michel is from austria uh, and he worked on various national and international energy and climate related projects his area of research revolves around the identification and measurement of social organizational and psychological factors that either support or hamper people from adopting climate friendly lifestyles uh, as well as collective actions and that is exactly what we're looking for today understanding concretely how those initiatives develop so Michel, up to you. So good morning to everyone from Austria, from the beautiful city of Graz. I'm going to share my screen. I hope you already can see it. Yes. And thanks, thank you for the introduction. As already said, I will present you some results or some research we did in the Compile project, which is a Europe Horizon 2020 project. I'm not going to talk about the project anymore, but of course you can look it up if you want to have more information on that. What I'm going to present you will uh, somehow now sound familiar to you because uh, you just have heard some familiar things from, from Martin and from Andrew, which is good of course because we have similar objectives. So if, if, if our approaches would have been completely different, obviously some of us would have been wrong. But this is not the case. Uh, and anyways, uh, the idea or the background is uh, that obviously there is a need by energy communities to have some tools or guidance on better to understand their development and their strengths and shortcomings of their energy community. Yeah, to really understand, okay, how can we further develop uh, and and become bigger, become more major. Yeah? And this was the idea of the maturity framework to try to come up with a framework to uh, assess specific, specifically this question and to understand the level of development. The approach we are taking here is quite uh, governance and structural driven, not so much activity driven, a little bit as, as, as Dan already said at the beginning. Uh, energy communities have a 
quite unique structure and many things happen on informal base. Uh, so we thought it might be a good idea to really focus on this governance structural aspects. Yeah? And the second thing is that we uh, focus strongly on what I call here soft indicators. Uh, meaning indicators which are not so ob ob obvious as, uh, for example, financial indicators or other indicators which are used especially in, in business-driven cases or, or, or um, actions. Yeah, uh, We are thinking that, uh, as the name already indicates, in energy communities, really the community is the core of the whole concept and we need to understand how this community especially works. Yeah, Therefore, the soft indicators. So you might ask at this point, okay, what do we mean with, with maturity? And what we mean is that uh, maturity means that the community is, is resilient and robust against uh, unexpected changes in the energy system. Yeah? And currently we had quite a lot of this, unfortunately, quite a lot of this unexpected changes with the rise of the energy prices, with the Ukraine war, uh, with all the Corona things. Uh, and we think, okay, a good community should be a community which is able to react to such, uh, such developments and to, f to be able to further persist even with all these changes. Yeah? So we really try to find the indicators which might help us to assess if a community, at least as we see it, is able to be major in this kind of sense. Yeah? Uh, our research is driven by some background assumptions which might be and can be and probably should be discussed. The first thing is, uh, other than what we just heard before, uh, that we think that it is possible to uh, find uh, indicators which are quite universal, usable for different kinds of energy communities, yeah? meaning small and big communities, as well as communities which are working on different fields of, of, of the energy sector, uh, be it energy distribution, be it uh, other energy services, be it efficiency or whatever. Nevertheless, we think, okay, uh, we can uh, come up with indicators which, which, are, which are useful for all of them. Yeah? Second thing is that we think and say, okay, dem democracy and democratic structures is an important point for communities. Yeah? Other than, for example, again, for business, there, there might be uh, really good and great businesses uh, with, with, without any democratic structures. We say, okay, no, for communities, this is a very important point and communities need to take care of being democratic in, in their structures. And the third thing is that probably also some communities see in another way is that uh, the main goal, as we see it, of an energy community is not necessarily to grow in size, but to become more diverse. Yeah, Here, going back to this maturity idea, a more diverse community will be able to react better uh, to, to different challenges and in their surroundings. And with that, with that background, and we had a lot of discussions here, we started a literature analysis, first of all, seeing, okay, what did other research reveal as, as potential important factors for energy communities? And we found around 46 indicators at the moment, and we grouped them into five categories. First is the community factors, which are really are the, the uh, factors that are linked directly to the community itself number and diversity of members, decision-making structure, um, core team structure, and so on. Yeah? Second uh, category is the staff and the organizational factors, uh, which is uh, dedicated to the question on how good the community is able to, to uh, get external expertise. Yeah? For example, with legal questions or financial questions, is there any staff uh, they can use to, to help them, to support them with these kind of questions? Third factors are the financial factors. This is pretty much what you know from all the business-driven uh, approaches, typically market values, return of investment, debts, uh, fundings, and so on. Yeah? Uh, for sure, important, important also for energy communities, but probably, as we see it, not, not necessarily the most important one. Next one is political and network factors, meaning does the community have support by political actors, for example, by local politicians? Do they support the actions of the community or do they even oppose it? 
uh, and other other networks, for example, as Rescue, who might uh, uh, help communities develop. And then at the end, we have the technical factors, which are dedicated to all the knowledge and technical aspects which come along with working in the energy sector. Uh, and we differentiate these uh, indicators into two different types. First are the so-called threshold indicators, and we see them as, as the important tipping points of a community. Yeah? Meaning if, if a community reaches such a tipping point, it will become more major, it will change to, an, it will progress to another stage in, uh, in the mat maturity of its, its being. Uh, such uh, threshold indicators might be, for example, there are rules for selecting uh, leaders before probably the community was a bunch of French, friends doing some uh, work together, but if the community grows in some times, they, they will need to develop a system to really select their leaders. And if they do that, we say, okay, they are in another more major stage of their uh, community. And then the Seven, second kind- One more minute. Oh, okay. I need to speed up a lot. Yeah. Second phase of indicators are so-called continuous indicators, uh, which can be seen all over the, uh, the phase of the community. And we distinguish in the communities four different stages, contemplation, preparation, implementation, and maintenance. Uh, so we also take the time aspect into account as we had in the last point. Here you just have an example of, of, of such indicators like numbers of members. You can see in the second column, uh, there are the threshold aspects of these indicators. The, in the other columns, there are the the continuous aspect, so an, an indicator can be as well a threshold indicator as a continuous indicator. Uh, yeah, and we uh, develop rules on, on how good they are assessed uh, for all our indicators. As I said, we had a list of 46 uh, indicators, and at the moment we are testing them in the Copile projects, uh, and we do it in this way that we uh, really talk to energy communities leaders and members and uh, ask them for all the indicators we have, okay, what do you think about them? Do you think they are useful? And if so, in what phase of your uh, energy community do you think they are useful? Uh, and with that, we hope to get a better picture uh, of the really important indicators, yeah? And here, I don't know how, how big the photos are on your screens, but probably you can see the excitement on the faces of the people. And uh, if, you if you want such, such, uh, to do such a workshop with your community, you are really invited to join us or, or to contact me or contact Stan and we can make such a workshop, workshop also in your, uh, with your energy communities. Yeah? Uh, first, some preliminary findings and I really cut the trot because it's preliminary. Uh, obviously, there are some indicators which are not very useful for uh, the energy communities, good to know, might be because they have difficulties to understand them, then we need to uh, formulate them better, or they are really of irrelevance. Yeah? And you see here some things we uh, identified as, as uh, irrelevant by, by the energy communities. Uh, and to come to an end, so to sum it up, we really try to come to develop with the maturity framework some kind of a dashboard which allows energy community to self-assess where they are with their uh, energy community and to see uh, what are their strengths and weaknesses and also allowing with that comparison between more major and less major uh, 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 energy communities, and really we try to develop here uh, uh, a tool which might help all the, the uh, uh, practically energy communities to develop. Yeah, and if you have more questions about that, feel free uh, to contact me or contact Stan, who also was was uh, important part here. Uh, and with that, I'm at the end, and thank you for your time. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Indeed, you can all see now the, the little differences in approaches, yet the, the, the core of the approach of the, the assessment is the same. And so now we're going to go to a third tool, which is part of the Scale 203050 project. Um, this tool of the monitoring tool will be presented by Thomas Hopper, who is an associate professor at the Delphi University of Technology. His research lines about governance of energy transition, focusing mostly on low carbon cities and regions, and particularly on energy communities. 
Um, Thomas is going to present the monitoring tool, which is, let's say, the latest addition in the family of assessment tools. And of course, that built on the experience of the two first ones. So Thomas, uh, up to you. Please try to keep it uh, at 10 minutes. Thank you. We can see your screen, Thomas, but we cannot hear you. Now you can hear me probably, apologies. Yes. Okay, let's start with a little old time to go. So what I'm going to present is uh, the, uh, the, in the monitoring tool and also the literature study that which we performed before we developed the monitoring tool. Um, yeah, so let's start with the literature. So first we did a thorough literature review on both the academic and gray literature to learn about the maturity and uh, development and scaling of community energy collectives. Um, and we first started at the basis. So uh, first to learn about the wider context, also to learn about how many definitions are basically used for in collective energy uh, uh, communities and renewable energy communities as they are coined by the European Union. Currently, there's even an article around that, that says that there are 187 definitions used uh, for this organization. So we tried to map this. Uh, then we also uh, met uh, historical developments and also focused on today's practice. And uh, next to looking at empirical literature and history, we also look to useful uh, theoretical frameworks and uh, using an STS and transition management approach. We basically focus on strategic niche management and uh, transformative social innovation, because of course, community energy can be seen as a predominant form of social innovation in energy transitions. So, um, then uh, we also did a literature review on preconditions for collective actions that renewable energy cooperatives uh, and communities can uh, engage in at the neighborhood level. Uh, so also the, the projects they can be involved in. And these projects are, of course, key in their uh, maturing. Um, then we looked into uh, ongoing uh, practices and actions and interventions implemented by these organizations. And we also looked to things like network formation, multi-stakeholder uh, management, citizen engagement, and how to do it and also uh, support and coping with resistance from the political systems. And next to that, we also, of course, being from a technical university, uh, have a technological focus, uh, both on renewable energy technologies to be deployed, but also on heating technology. And next to that, also very important, the digital technologies, coping with data uh, privacy and uh, coping with cybersecurity and things that are becoming more and more important also for the resilience of uh, community and industry organization. And based on these three chapters, and of also standing on the shoulders of what's going on in ECHO and Compile with the maturity scale and OSS, we um, developed a monitoring tool uh, based on a framework of indicators, which are uh, in common to, with parts of OSS and also parts of the Compile uh, maturity scale. A uh, short uh, explanation about the theoretical frameworks used. Uh, first, uh, strategic niche management, which uh, in an article by uh, uh, Naber and Raven basically presents three ways in which uh, scaling can take place. Scaling as growth from one neighborhood to another and in terms of community energy uh, getting more uh, membership. Uh, then replication from one uh, geographical entity to another, let's say from, from, from Belgium with eco power to, to, to Poland, where there was less community energy action. Um, but also in terms of what was also mentioned in the previous presentations, in terms of networking, uh, developing intermediary organizations with their libraries, uh, one-stop shops, and uh, basically offering support and empowering uh, a local experimentation of community energy and also helping them with translocal networks. So um, uh, via Rescoop EU network, for instance, uh, learning and bringing tools from the Netherlands to Germany or vice versa or to, to Greece. And, and networks are quite important there. That's also from the academic literature. Another framework used um, and that, that's more uh, recently developed is transformative social innovation, um, where renewable energy 
communities are seen to have transformative capacity with the aim to change institutions and the social technical system of energy markets in the end, with the key role of local experimentation, translocal networks, and the role of intermediaries. Um, but next to that, a lot of other variables are also important. I don't have time to go in that uh, right now, but it is important uh, in our thought and the way we develop the monitoring tool. Uh, of course, next to these theoretical frameworks, we also uh, try to stand on the shoulders of giants in, the, in this uh, case, this, um, uh, the OSS and the maturity scale. Um, looking to uh, the, the literature review, uh, we basically came up with the four, we copied more or less the, the four stages presented in the maturity scale and some of the indicators mentioned that, but uh, as we did the literature study, uh, we also uh, inserted uh, many new indicators or KPIs, which we also consider important. And we, but we did classify them according to what also was done in the maturity scale, so both social looking to the local community, looking to staff and organization of the renewable energy community, financial indicators, political indicators, technical indicators, and also finally learning and scaling. Because the scale project is of course scaling community energy practice, so we definitely also want to take this into account. Um, so we made this table and then we presented all the indicators we found and we checked them at the project partner meeting in September 2021 with an interactive session uh, with the project partners, which led us to develop even more uh, project indicators. One of the issues of special importance is technical complexity. There are individual technologies and collective forms with DH systems. Uh, I'm not going into this one, but in very important is uh, the monitoring tool. Uh, currently it's developed. Right now it's still an Excel form. Um, uh, and, and you can fill in for each uh, stage that you're in uh, different items, different questions. And based on that, uh, um, an, an automatic assessment takes place, which also provides results in the dashboard, but also presents a to-do list for all items that are present. And uh, uh, actions are also formulated on what to do on to increase performance on certain items. Besides that, we also have links included to the OSS, uh, to, to tools, guidelines, etc., on how to uh, improve. This is more or less how it looks like. Um, and currently, uh, we are uh, in progress. To say, let's say, first draft of the tool has been delivered. And right now, we're in the stage of monitoring this year and next year via expert review workshops with, within scale, but also by reflection on five uh, pilot projects uh, within scale. Um, and that's what we're, we will be doing. So the tool is not, not yet available, uh, but uh, next year it will be. And that's about it. Great, thank you very much, Thomas. And thank you for going an accelerated version at the end. Uh, indeed, a very interesting work that is going on uh, into the SCALE project. I'm very sorry that we cannot go more into detail into each of the tools. Obviously, um, it would be, you know, a, it would need probably a full day just to actually discuss the different parameters that are in each of those tools. The most important thing, though, is to take into, uh, uh, that I take away, let's say, from those three presentations is the fact that the approach is rather coherent in terms of the way to understand energy communities and their role into the, the, the transition process, let's say. both in terms of, you know, the niche initiative, yet the niche initiative, meaning, you know, the, the, the opportunity for scaling and taking, you know, pushing it to a, a kind of a mainstream approach in terms of the community development, but yet as well, also in terms of the different factors that are really constituting the experience of community energy and the experience of community energy is really what we want to talk about i mean at the end of the day the goal of creating uh, you know all those tools and to having all this research is to guide community practitioners one of the efforts that i'd like to point out from all the research teams today is the effort that they made to go and be in contact with practitioners from the get-go to leverage their experience and so we will have, uh, we, we now move on, sorry, to the, the, the next stage of our session, which is uh, the community energy practitioners and how they can, uh, you know, what is the experience, let's say, of building onto the, uh, the, the, 
the work that has been done on the research. And here we have three uh, leaders of the community energy movement. Siwat Somet from Energy Salmon. Siwat is the corporate director of Energy Salmon and is a board member of Rescue for You. Uh, he's uh, responsible for creating new services as part of Energy Salmon. And he was also um, the chairman of the Windfogel uh, Cooperative for seven years in the Netherlands. We then will have also Marion Richard from Energy Partagé. Marion is the head of national coordination for Energy Partagé, uh, who is the French Federation of Energy Cooperatives. And she joined the Federation in 2018. And um, she, uh, grew the federation to up to 300 members uh, by today. And finally, from Croatia, Mislav Kirak from ZEZ. Mislav is the, one of the co-founders of the Green Energy Cooperative ZEZ, where he works as a program coordinator. He gathered extensive experience in the energy transition and community development as part of the NDP, UNDP program, where he co coordinated several international programs. So I'll ask the, uh, the panelists to maybe turn on their camera briefly. So we can see and hear more about you. And I can stop sharing because at the end of the day, the goal is really to have a conversation here uh, for, for the speakers. Um, so the, the most important thing before we start maybe is to, 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 as we want this panel to be more of a conversation is to a bit get to know each other. So we have prepared a couple of polls so we can all know who is in the room today. Uh, and the first thing to know is where are you coming from? So uh, we'll launch the poll now and I'll ask you to answer it before we start the panel. And in the meantime, I'll introduce a little bit what we're going to talk about with our speakers today. So I'll launch the poll. So the, the goal of the panel today is to learn from the experience of community energy practitioners and specifically uh, what the three federations in different countries have done to support the development of community energy. Uh, the interesting thing here is that there are three very different approaches to community development. Uh, Mislav in, in Croatia has been specifically supporting, or Zez in Croatia has been specifically supporting the entire region, uh, including the Balkans, Serba, Serbia, Bosnia, Bulgaria, and to the development of a community energy movement of their own, as well as developing community energy initiative in Croatia. And so that international experience is quite unique, considering the two other federations that we have that are very nationally driven. In uh, France, Energie Partagée is not only a, a key driver to support the development of the community energy movement, but also is looking at um, the, 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 the development and the financing of energy projects in relationship with local authorities. And that's really where we see a different approach where the community energy movement in other countries have developed away from uh, public support. In France, uh, there is this involvement of public lobby that is very important. And Energy Summer is probably one of the most, or let's say the fastest growing uh, energy cooperative network in, uh, in, in, in Europe today with multiple services, including the development of very large infrastructure project in district heating. And in that, I mean, we're, I'm keen to hear from, from you, see what on exactly how uh, this is happening. How do you develop such complex project with, um, with community energy initiatives? But, First things first, let's share the results of our poll and uh, we can take a look at who is actually in the room today. So we do have a majority of researchers, which considering the topic is uh, rather uh, not surprising. Um, but then we also have a couple of uh, community energy members as well. Fantastic. You don't see the poll, uh, Stan. Uh, you don't see the poll, okay. Where is my poll? Can I Uh, good question. How do I share the results of the poll? Um, Helene, could you help me out? I don't, I can't access the poll as a host. <laughs> I'm sorry. No problem. Okay. So can I share at least? So if I share my screen, you guys don't see the results of the poll? No. Okay. Never mind. Doesn't matter. Uh, I think the important part is here. There is a majority of researchers in the room today, so we can go into the details on that. Yet, before we start, I think that the one of the key uh, uh, one of the key lessons that came out of the conversation with the research teams is um, the importance of the environmental factors. What I mean by environmental factors is really the different factors that are, that are kind of 
uh, helping the emergence of energy communities and that are kind of uh, you know framing the activities that energy communities are taking and so there i'm curious to hear from from uh, from everybody around what exactly is the most important thing that you think uh, is is a key factor in terms of the development of energy communities so i'll launch a second poll and here we can talk about you know what is the most important piece of the development of a, of a strong community energy movement is it the regulatory framework is it the economic conditions themselves positive or negative is it the availability of uh, resources or is it cultural values uh, and and you know the, the aspect of culture being you know the key part of the uh, the development of community energy projects obviously you can see that those those answers are very oriented, right? What I'm trying to get at is, you know, the experience that um, we are having through Europe right now, both in terms of the transposition, right, and the endless discussion that we're having around energy communities um, and how it encourages the development of the community energy movement, and then also, you know, the differentiations between certain countries. One thing maybe to point out before we start the debate is that the community energy movement was existing before the definitions of energy communities, before the clean energy package. In many countries, there was a development of a community energy movement, which was quite strong. And so it's interesting to think about that as well and uh, about the variety and the universality of the development of the community energy movement. So I unfortunately don't really know how to show you the results, but I'll just read them out for you. And Misla, maybe we can start with you and the work that you guys have been doing, because 30% of our, uh, our participants think that cultural values are absolutely crucial in the development of community energy. Um, obviously, the biggest answer is uh, regulatory frameworks, which is 52%. And then the third one is economic conditions, at 19%. Cultural values, Misla, you guys have been supporting the development of movements in a wide variety of countries, not, not only in Croatia, but also in, in neighboring countries. How do, you, how do you see that? Is it difficult for you? Is it something that, uh, you know, you, did you go against uh, day after day, the cultural values, the cultural aspects? Uh, uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, and hi, everybody. Yeah, I mean, the answers uh, are uh, something which I would... Uh, uh, somewhat expect at least from the from from my position from from Croatia and from this part of Europe. Uh, uh, it, it would be it would be nice to see uh, from where all uh, the participants are coming from, uh, because I think that the answers would probably be quite quite different from uh, from country to country in Europe. Uh, but yeah, I would agree. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the regulatory framework it's like half fifty two percent. And, and it's, uh, I would say that it's, uh, j just to make a, a small comment on regulatory framework, uh, I think it's easy to, to, uh, to have this regulatory framework as a red uh, herring or, or as, a, as, a, as a red flag uh, in front of you, because uh, the regulation is really something which is technical and, and it's written and you can attack it, you can analyze it and you can uh, propose some changes, concrete changes, which, and it's more concrete but uh, and, and the social values uh, around energy communities is something which is not really uh, um, so much visible. Uh, uh, you cannot just say, okay, we, we, we need to do this and that because it's uh, all a bit you know vague. But certainly social values, uh, first of all, social values is something which is feeding into the uh, regulatory framework and, and how regulatory framework is, uh, actually implemented and how it is uh, uh, understood in a certain context. So it's uh, uh, very important. But but really, the social criteria and so the social uh, aspect is something which is underlying, uh, at least here in, in Croatia, but but also uh, very similar in Serbia and Bosnia, where we uh, do uh, the majority of our international work. And uh, so I would say that 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 it's something which you encounter. On a daily basis, and um, so so uh, whether you're talking to the municipal leaders, uh, mayors, and, and municipal municipality leaders, or do you talk with the representatives of the regulators, ministries, policy makers, decision makers, uh, uh, DSOs, TSOs, you know all, all the eco ecosystem of uh, needed to to uh, to enable uh, the, the environment for energy communities to thrive. 
you you see this uh, uh, lack of understanding and lack of uh, uh, experience in this in this kind of uh, movements. Uh, so it's uh, it, it's definitely a challenge. Even if you would have a, a perfect you know picture perfect regulatory framework, we would still have you know a lot to do only to to change the the, the social norms and social uh, aspects of uh, of the community energy uh, movement here in this region i i think i can uh, i'm confident enough to to, to speak for a few countries here in in this part of europe yeah so and of course uh, uh, yeah I'm, I'm so, oh, sorry yeah say if you have a oh, good 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 just just maybe final comment uh, it's interesting what you say that uh, I, I really uh, it's really hard for me to to always talk about the regulatory framework it, it's like you you it's it's always easy to say this and and hide behind it but uh, what you say that the energy community movement didn't start with the clean energy package so it's uh, especially in the in the in northern europe so it, it's 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 been here for decades and uh, but I would say that this new uh, package, that was just the, the other day we were discussing here in the office. Uh, so uh, it seems like it was easier back then, uh, uh, at least uh, regulatory, uh, uh, from the regulatory perspective, because you probably had some feed in and it was, yeah, just uh, uh, let's do some project and, and we, we have a security of a feed in tariff, et cetera. Now it seems that uh, at least we, we are confused in ZEZ and, and let alone uh, the, the citizens are completely confused about the, the energy community. W what, what is it actually and how did, what are the models? And it seems like you have to be a, a, at least a, a you know, second degree uh, researcher and a PhD to, to understand and design the model uh, and, and how to actually swim in this kind of uh, regulatory uncertainty right now. So it, it, it it, it really is, at, at least from uh, at, at currently, it doesn't seem like a, you know, just no brainer, uh, get a bunch of people and pitch the project and, and, and you're done. It, it looks like you, you, you're, you have to have uh, at least a, a research institution behind you to, to, to just, you know, tweak all the, all the parameters and buttons and then uh, it, it's highly sophisticated right now at least it seems so so uh, th that is something i'm not so uh, uh, fond of and i would like to to to, to have a more clear uh, and more robust model which can be replicated more rapidly because at this uh, rate it's uh, it, it's it's very slow and it's uh, and it's only reserved for you know uh, early adopters and, and enthusiasts yeah Thank you, Mr. I'm, I'm wondering, Marion, how would you not necessarily respond to that, but I would say, you know, maybe add to that. I mean, Energy Partage is very much working with local authorities. The French culture, and I, can, I think I can speak for that myself, even though I don't want to be the, 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 maybe the speaker for the French people, but I think we do have a culture, an energy culture at least, where you know, the magic plug was very strong. We had this aspect of, you know, um, the, the state is taking care of energy and not of, you know, not, it's not the problem of private citizens. Uh, then again, the, you know, the, the, the regulatory framework in France has been evolving quite a bit. So it's definitely something that might be positive in that regard. Yet, I mean, some of the, problems that we've seen is also a problem of availability. I mean, 0% of the people thought that sources availability was an issue for the development of energy communities. Yet, a recent report in France is showing that there is no more wind to be developed on land. It's almost impossible to develop wind on land at the moment. Um, why? What do you think about that? What do you think about the position of Misla, which is, well, you know, it, it's a problem of culture, first and foremost. And then secondly, let's clarify and simplify as well. What is, what is your opinion on that? Well, that's a very difficult question. Um, of course, cultural aspects are important. Um, and just, just as an example, um, yes, and in, in, in France, we have a very um, centralized uh, culture. Um, so the state um, is, is, is we're used to well the state doing everything, and 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 it's 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 funny to um, 
it's interesting to note that uh, the, the definition, our collective definition in France of, of uh, a community energy is, an, um, is a renewable energy source, sources developed by citizens, but also uh, by local authorities. Uh, we have this very strong relationship with working with local uh, authorities. So the, the, the public sector is, is very important. To answer your question, um, um, it's, it's all important. I would say regulatory um, framework is, is, I mean, cultural aspects influence the regulatory framework and on the reverse. Um, we have felt in the last 10, 15 years, um, a strong, I mean, a growing will. And that I mean, the will is, is, is a cultural aspect, I would say it's, it's belonging to a cultural aspect of um, first local authorities and then also citizens to, um, well, to, to take part uh, in, in the decisions uh, recording um, energy and uh, developing en energy sources. And this has been influencing the uh, re regulatory framework. And uh, regarding um, availability, I mean, there is wind in France. The problem is not the availability. The problem is um, uh, the regulatory framework that makes it impossible to develop wind because um, of the army, of the French army. So it's, it's not a problem of, of availability. Um, so, and, and that's for regulatory framework and, and culture. You know, we are friends. We have to have a, we have to defend ourselves um, from outside attack, mostly from the Germans, I, I would say. Um, no, that's really, no, we really, I mean, it's, 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 um, so it's, 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 it's all, um, it's all linked, but uh, maybe, maybe, yes, um, to answer to um, uh, Miss Love, I, I answered uh, the re regulatory framework, maybe because it's my job. <laughs> But uh, yes, you can you can change you can influence uh, cultural aspects also by changing the law and and in reverse. That's that's what I would answer. Okay, uh, see what I'm curious if you want to react to that as well. I mean, what is the in energy summit? I think you guys have been successful in triggering a lot of initiatives moving forward. So how do you deal with that? I don't think Dutch people are. I mean, there are great things in the Netherlands, but I don't think Dutch people are much more compatible to community energy than, than any other person in Europe or any other European. Or am I wrong? Um, no, it's always useless to discuss whether it's one or the other. It's always, uh, you need to look at how the relationship between uh, certain aspects on how that uh, involves uh, and changes the the economic conditions or the regulatory conditions and the cultural conditions. Um, what we see is ANG Sound, like we're a national federation, um, but we're working very hard to get regional um, cooperatives of energy cooperatives in that region uh, to support the local uh, energy communities. It's because we have a decentralized uh, uh, planning law which where local communities decides to give permits. So uh, the energy transition is very decentralized by us. Right? All the permits go on a le local level to get a permit or either to even go into the uh, legal process to get a permit, you need to have a, a democratic votes from the community. So, and that legal framework strengthens our position because um, now we can say in local policies and say, we're happy to start a legal procedure to give a permit unless you involve the community. So we have an, on a national level, uh, uh, a non-binding community energy target, which lands down on local level in uh, planning, planning procedures, which makes it uh, binding to a certain extent. So um, yes, yeah, the way the Netherlands is structured you get also a cultural division. Um, we have from history, a lot of cooperatives also for the same reason. Um, and we have decentralized and de democratized our water systems also for the same reason. So 
Um, and if you, like in France, centralize everything, you get a different structure of how you support energy communities, which is fine. And that is the most beautiful thing. And the strength of energy communities is they are they have the freedom to organize themselves to the local context. So that's the strength of working uh, with us and to get this multi-level, um, what the, the um, structure, what the, all, basically all research is presented. Um, if you want to do something from Europe and help local communities, it's impossible to get a one-stop shop on a European level uh, for, uh, not a one-stop shop, but a one-stop um, uh, uh, framework that fits every national uh, thing. So you need this, this polycentric governance system throughout Europe that fits the local context at, at, in any country. And then, um, yeah, that's why, why we, we fit so well in every, in every structure in every country. And we can reach to the, the front door of citizens um, with any, any projects that we can do. Um, if you centralize anything in Europe, that doesn't work. So we have for the last couple of years in the Netherlands, but also in Europe, of course, we've built up a massive valuable uh, framework, a network of citizens and groups of citizens that can be used to trickle down all these policies, innovation budgets or to the local level. Because if you do that in Brussels, we won't know anything that, that it happened or not. Fantastic. Well, I, I do agree with that. It's the, the aspect of decentralization. I mean, and, and this, at the same time, relevance of the concept at the European level, while at the same time being adaptable to the local level is, is tremendously important. Yet that adaptability, or let's say this, this uh, you know, multi-format, multifaceted aspect kind of brings up the question, which is that we see also more and more fake, quote unquote, energy communities appearing. Uh, all across Europe, as the, the the concept is deploying, and I think Mislav, you touched on it with the, the you know the technical aspects. Sometimes the the legal framework is so difficult that it actually benefits certain specialists rather than citizen collectives. So I'll open the, the the third question, which is how do you recognize a community energy initiative? What what is a the key for the key uh, point that is characterizing a community energy initiative. Um, and there, I'm curious to hear from you, Marion, because I think Energy Partage has built a tool for that, right? A label that is decisively pointing out to what is true community energy versus what is not. Uh, the answers right now are, are coming in. Um, and I mean, for me, there are four things that are kind of like come out of the discussion of the European. On one hand, there's the governance model, right, for uh, community energy. The second one is the ownership model. Granted, the two might be a bit linked. The activities, and finally, the participants. So uh, what would be for you the, the important point, let's say? Asking me now, or are you asking the whole, uh, all participants? No, you, 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 go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, it's... Um... For Energie Partagée, it's, 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 it's um, also it's governance and ownership, but it's also other aspects um, that he did not point. <laughs> um, it's, uh, uh, I'll, I'll start with, because um, there is no uh, legal definition in France of uh, community energy and uh, the definition of community and energy is the one we created. Uh, we collectively energy partage as a as a network. So um, and that was more than ten years ago. We uh, we created a, a charter. And if you wanted to get support by energy partage, either uh, financial support or communication or um, a technical support, uh, you had to respect the, uh, this charter. So we had a commission that was looking at, okay, if, does this project respect the, the charter or not? Um, but then we considered that it was, uh, we had to develop a more uh, structure and an and objective way of deciding whether you are a community project or, or not. Uh, so we developed a, a tool 
it's it's called the compass and i mean it's it 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 it's I think it's similar to some of the tools that were presented before in some ways. So it has um, 12 criteria and, and five factors. And, and well, it's one is governance, shared governance. Um, I mean, all decisions are uh, have to be taken in a democratic and, and tr uh, transparent way. Um, the other is, is interest of the local community. So that means a strong presence, strong ownership of, of uh, local actors. Um, local actors being citizens, but also m might be uh, local authorities, <laughs> again. <laughs> um, there's the local dynamic, meaning um, uh, using local competences, local enterprises, uh, mobilizing local actors. Ecology, that's also a strong, uh, important thing. Uh, the project is, is uh, uh, reducing its environmental impacts, is also in, in, in the logic of uh, reducing uh, of uh, developing activities uh, of, of uh, reducing energy consumption, consumption, and also the aspect of, of ethical um, finance. It's about mobilizing uh, citizen savings, uh, local authorities' investment capacities. So maybe you can also link that to um, ownership. Um, um, so and I'm, my answer to interrupt, but I'm curious to, to, to talk about that point specifically around ownership and governance. So you put the ownership on maybe, local may, euros. May, may, maybe I don't really know what you mean by ownership. Um, so I'm going to take. So the ownership yeah, meaning like yeah. the capital, the actual yeah, money, yeah, the ownership, yeah. right? Versus the governance could be like the actual votes, the members, the people yeah. that can decide the outcome. Yeah. And so I'm curious too, because in, in the explanation that you're making right now, there is a differentiation as well, which I do agree with, by the way. But I'm curious to hear between, usually in most of the models, and, and I mean, I'm curious to hear from the other speakers in the panel as well, the ownership and the governance are intrinsically linked, right? If you own something, you control it. And so there is a notion of you need to have citizen control through the financial aspect. But what I hear from you is that this is not necessarily the case in France. Uh, the local authority could bring most of the funds, yet the democratic uh, aspect or the democratic model could allow everybody to have the same weight. Is that a fair understanding or that's not the case? Uh, it depends. Any, uh, in any case, you need to have citizens uh, in the project in order that's to be considered uh, a community energy project. Um, you need to have citizens uh, and but, uh, and there are some, actually, I don't know the exact numbers, but um, you need to have uh, a certain percentage of, of citizens' uh, ownership in the, pro um, in, the, in, the pro in the project also. Uh, but uh, so there are some criteria on citizen and local authorities. Um, governance and on ownership, and then some specific criteria on local citizens' ownership. So we have both. Um, we, yeah. yeah. In the Netherlands, we have a, a special uh, support scheme for energy communities. It's called um, subsidy for the production of community energy. Um, it's it's like a feed-in pre premium for only for energy cooperatives. Uh, we will have a different definition in uh, the new energy law, but here the main, we, we discussed it for two years with the ministries and we could think of any form of um, misabuse or uh, how you could um, uh, pretend that you were or not. And we ended up with a massive regulatory framework which would be such a threshold for the actual ones to, to jump over. And then we skipped all that and we said, we just put in one rule. It needs to be one member, one vote. And that's the rule that basically some uh, companies try, but then they realize that if they put all the money and they want all the profit, then somebody else can decide that they don't get it. And then they stop doing it. So the one member, one vote for me seems to be very... Um, good check whether it's not uh, if, if it's an actual energy community or it's just two local entrepreneurs pretending to be uh, one so um, and I think it works we see a couple of 
things where you go like, all right, it's not really one member, one vote, but uh, on base on 700 projects and you see two or three, I think it, it works very well. We uh, here we don't we don't always have one member one vote we but uh, we uh, and not all uh, projects are cooperatives per se because actually the uh, the framework for cooperatives in, in France are very strict um, very very strict according what uh, uh, yeah so but uh, what is very important is because. Um, I don't know if it's the case in, in, in other countries, but in France, like bigger projects um, are mostly done with um, citizens, uh, may, maybe local authorities, and also a private operator, because we are not strong enough. There are some projects, but very few that 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 manage to to do it with citizens alone or, or only citizens and, and local authorities. But usually we don't, we're um, local cooperatives, um, uh, don't manage to to do it uh, alone, so we, we we need private uh, operators. But then, what's really important is the transparency. Like people need to uh, be aware of the economic model. Uh, decisions uh, need to be transparent, and they need to understand. So, if, especially if there is a private operator, he needs to say, "Okay, what what is my economic model? Uh, where do I make my money?" because he will make the money. And that's, that's also very important for us so that non-professional are, um, are at the same level and can understand, okay, uh, can, yeah, can make also decisions and, and, and understand, yeah, what is the interest of the private operator? So that's also very important for, for, for us. I'm and, curious, Mr. I'm sorry, I'll yeah. you again, apologies. Uh, yes, and just, no, there were just to say. So, in the end, we this this tool we developed was an internal uh, internal evaluation tool, but then we decided it was really great, and uh, so we decided to make it a label, because so that's an external uh, tool. So because also as I said, there is no official um, definition of community energy. Now there are energy communities, but there was no, and, and actually there are some slight differences between our definition and the new energy community uh, definition that, that will um, be passed in a few months. So the label is according to the definition we decided we wanted uh, for energy, uh, for community energy. I'm, I'm um, curious, Ms. Stom, Lange, could, yeah. Stom, I just have a question. We have some questions in the chat and there's yes. five more minutes to go. So maybe you want to address those as well, just to- uh... Yes, I was about to address one of those yeah, uh, specifically. Okay. And I'm hoping for Misla actually to answer that because it's linked to what Mayan just said. Let's say that the ownership of the means of production is the key aspect of an energy community, the ownership of the means of production or not. I mean, what I hear now is um, that somehow, you know, France is in a very similar situation in Croatia, at least when we discussed the last time, which is that, well, it's very difficult to raise that much capital. Right? It's difficult to raise that much money to get the projects going. And so but we'd rather be part of it and to let the ownership be with an external actor or through a model that is transparent enough, but yet we are part of it and we can at least invest, you know, a piece or let's say control a piece. What is your opinion on that? Because I mean, it, it is a difficult debate, right? It's a, it's a, it's a negotiation uh, that you have to do with yourself as a movement. Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, uh, like, if I would have to decide on, on this, on, on the spot, I would, I would probably take it, you know, because at least from this perspective right now, where we are in, in a like so much headwind is here, uh, despite the only uh, regulatory framework, which in theory are uh, like uh, sh should give us a tailwind and, and support and everything. But but to make a case, just to make uh, 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 first few cases where citizens are uh, actually participating in a way um, as an, as a co-owners. That would be that would be great. Uh, I think that, that because uh, what you're saying, magic plug. 
and, and it's also here, of course, like centralized production and, and people are only now starting to, you know, uh, uh, barely trying to uh, see that, that that not just that the state is, does not produce power, but uh, it's liberalized market, but also that they can produce their own power for their themselves and for other neighbors, etc. So it's a. It, I, I would say I would take it, uh, uh, and uh, and I think that that those are at least from Croatian uh, context, it, it would be like. Uh, very nuanced uh, discussion whether it's uh, like uh, whether it's uh, ideal energy community or not but uh, yeah i would i would strive to do uh, uh, like 100% community owned projects but um, if city of zagreb offered offered us you know uh, you know engage 200 people and uh, and be uh, this is the 20% of the project which you will own uh, as as a cooperative, we would we would say yeah, of course we we want to kickstart uh, you know <laughs> these things here. We would otherwise, uh, who knows when when we will really have this uh, ideal project uh, completed. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, for us, we have a basic principle: like when we advise our members, of course they can choose to just financially invest and. If they're in no position to negotiate, then it could be a nice money stream that they can get to develop further. But if you actually want an energy community that supports its uh, and develops its energy system on a local level, a lot further than just pure production, uh, we're talking about mobility, uh, energy savings, uh, and you start to think in, uh, in the system, then you need to have ownership of the money streams and the energy streams. And that means you need to own the assets. It's as simple as that. And nobody else can will give you all, if you don't invest in it and you don't own it, then you don't own the money streams and you don't own it. So when you think further than just pure financial investment, then you need to own it. And of course, you can work together with private companies. Hey, here, most energy communities work together with a private developer who owns 50% of the park and the community owns the other 50, but they're often uh, split up in separate entities where they both um, have their own um, PPA or uh, um, power purchase agreement. So they both control the energy stream. The one guy wants to sell it for the highest price. The other one wants to sell it to the community. So th that's how we, we split it up and yeah, we, even Dutch regulation made that possible where you can have two suppliers on one um, connection to the grid. So it's just uh, technologically um, administrated. So, um, and, I, I, and that's what we always invest uh, in um, uh, advice because I saw a, uh, a question about people to people and that's what we think we're going to especially now with the highest energy prices people aren't going to build wind turbines anymore because there are some abstract co2 goals in paris or in the hague they are going to build wind turbines to supply their own energy on a local level so if some again for cost price so they're going to calculate what the the wind turbines cost what the solar panel cost what the system cost and that's the price what they're going to deliver to their members because now with the high energy prices you don't they don't want to be dependent on the on the uh, the market anymore they want to create their own local market so then yeah it's very logical then you need to own um the assets and then for that's why i i i um talk about like i filled in ownership in the in the poll <laughs> fantastic well, it's uh, 11.29. I see more questions coming in specifically around solidarity. Uh, I also see the comment of Marion as well on the, the veto. That could be a very interesting discussion to have down the line on, you know, the power of a veto versus the power of conversation or, or governance or, you know, what is exactly, you know, um, control in that sense. And is veto control, yes or no? Uh, but I think we will have to close the session at the moment. Um, what is left for me to do is to thank you very, very much for being with us today. Uh, Marion, Mislav, Siewert, and of course the researchers as well. 
to thank the participants for you know holding the conversation with us and and listening in and uh, of course you'll get all the materials and the content as well as the contacts for our speakers today so if you want to continue the conversation on those aspects uh, i'm sure that they would be very happy to answer any of your questions thank you all very much and uh, we'll see you later on this afternoon for the next session of uh, energy communities empowering our future conference thank you bye bye Goodbye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye, you. Everybody. Thanks for everything.